Well, welcome to the Monash Biomedical Imaging uh, webinar. I'm Associate Professor Michael Farrell and I'll be your host today. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land Monash University is positioned. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. On a housekeeping matter, questions can be submitted using the Q&A window at any time and our speaker will address your questions after their presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Professor Gary Egan is Director of Monash Biomedical Imaging, Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Integrative Brain Function, and a distinguished professor at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health at Monash University. He's also lead investigator of the Victorian Biomedical Imaging Capability and Deputy Director of the Australian National Imaging Facility Gary's had an enormous influence on the development and prosecution of biomedical research, both here in Australia and through his uh, extensive international collaborations. Most notably, uh, Gary has a substantial publication record in the fields of neuroimaging and neuroscience. So I'd now like to invite Gary to share his thoughts on the year that it was and speak about future opportunities for biomedical imaging research. Thank you, Gary. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, it's great to be able to present today and to give a, a review of 2020 at MBI. Whew, what a year, amazing year. Um, who knew what it was gonna be like back in March? I think we're getting pretty frazzled by the middle of the year and you know, it's just gone on and on. So incredible year, probably a year like we'll never have again. Um, um, but it's been amazingly productive, um, which I'll share with you through my presentation today. And it's also um, been a number of very exciting developments that have happened through this year, which are gonna impact greatly on us um, next year and in the years ahead. Um, so I just wanted to start by putting up all of the MBI and Arambi uh, staff. Um, this is a combination of people from last year and this year some of um, whom who are no longer with us, but I'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, um, I do wanna acknowledge all of the staff and thank you all for your fantastic work throughout 2020. It's been an amazing team effort and um, you know, really, I think everything that's been achieved is because of the people that we have at MBI. Um, I think it's an outstanding group of people and I'm so pleased to be able to um, give you today an update on all the outcomes from 2020. Um, here's a slide of the instrumentation and facilities which exist at the Monash uh, MBI Clayton node and at the Arambi node at the Alfred Hospital. Um, I think many of you have probably seen this slide before and it's, it's I think testimony to the efforts of the development of MBI over the last decade. Um, I do want to actually acknowledge at this point um, that MBI would not exist except for Professor Ian Smith, who was the uh, Vice Provost of Research and Research Infrastructure until the end of this year. He's now retired. Um, Ian was absolutely the person who um, led the development of MBI back in 2009, 2010. Um, and what's been achieved is, is very much um, a legacy to his amazing impact that's happened at Monash University. I do wanna highlight a couple of instruments um, that you can see on this slide. One there that I've just highlighted in green is green for go. We've got the MRI guided focused ultrasound for preclinical studies up and running. I'll speak about that a little bit later. I've had that on the slide for a little while and it's now green. Um, we also have a magnetic particle imaging instrument, which is um, at, at the Arambi site, installed mostly, not fully, but will be up and operational in probably the mid first quarter next year. So we've achieved some of those, uh, two of those three uh, future instruments. Um, and the third, as you can guess, might be the cyclotron. I put a dashed orange line around that. That's um, almost uh, in, in, in the process. And I'll give a little bit of an update about that as well later in the talk. Um, I do want to mention Brain Park, which is co-located with MBI. Uh, Brain Park is a fantastic facility and it's been now open for a year or two. 
um, very much synergistically located with all of the imaging and other instrumentation and expertise at NDI. So I think as um, you look at that uh, repertoire of instrumentation and expertise and facilities, it's really unsurpassed, certainly within Australia, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably on a par with anywhere else in the world doing this sort of research. Um, so I'm going to go through the teams at MBI and just give you a brief update of teams, team members, team achievements in 2020, and in some cases, a little bit of information about um, what, what 2021 will hold. Firstly, with the management and administration team, it's been delightful having Kylie Reid join as a general manager at the start of this year. I think it was probably the most bizarre new position that anyone could come into with, it, with her team. In fact, only being able to meet with them face to face for the first month or so from sort of February through to early March and then doing everything remote for six or seven months. Um, so Kylie's been leading the management admin team. And apart from just the challenges of leading a team um, remotely, um, there's been the challenge of dealing with all of the COVID-19 requirements, policies and procedures um, across the university. It's been a very rapidly changing landscape. Um, they have achieved uh, really so much in terms of keeping all of us safe. We haven't, of course, had any cases of COVID infections or transmissions across the facility. So that's really terrific. Um, but then more specifically with research activity, we were open right through that period for preclinical work as essential research services. Um, and in some cases for some human studies, but now just recently in the last four or five weeks reopened fulsomely for the human research imaging program. So that's because there's been so many COVID-19 policies, um, instrument cleaning procedures, and um, adherence to the COVID safety requirements throughout the facility, documented, risk assessed, and approved for then doing um, that research work. Of course, a lot of that was due to Nikki Thompson, who we recently farewelled. Um, Nikki's now left MBI after about six or seven years and a much longer period at Monash University. And Nikki's contribution in all of those areas I've just mentioned was, was really absolutely um, pivotal and, and outstanding. So COVID's been the big challenge, I think, for management and administration. Um, as I mentioned, there was also some instrumentation um, installation, uh, the one at the Alfred with the MPI, but also Brain Park has also installed a new treadmill um, this year funded with an NHMRC grant. Um, we've got a new 32 channel MR PET head coil for the Biograph system, which was uh, procured and installed and made operational. Improved MR images um, as a consequence of using that, that new head coil, that's really important. Quite a lot of uh, developments around what we call the imaging research information system. So this is the IRIS um, application and database to assist researchers in collecting and storing um, subject specific data in a um, confidential and secure manner. There'll be more work on that um, throughout 2021. There's been an upgrade in the radiochemistry services, although not as much as we'd hoped. We've got a new lab designed. Uh, Brett Patterson, who came on as the radiochemistry facility fellow at the beginning of this year, um, has been designing that, um, but we haven't yet had the capacity to install that and get the work going. Um, and there's been um, at the Alfred site, um, in addition to the MPI, ongoing improvements to the preclinical facilities there and uh, animal holding facilities. So a huge amount of work done by the management and admin team, as well as the instruments um, and the COVID procedures has been the renewal, um, if you like, recertification of the MBI platform under the platform quality management system. Uh, that was um, really excellent, just done uh, last month. Um, and it has some opportunities for improvements, but it was um, audited and approved without any non-conformances. So that was a great achievement. Um, PQMS is a word that we've grown to love, I think you might say. Uh, perhaps not as much as some other words, but at least something that we now embrace and uh, we really believe that that adds to the quality of the research imaging services and, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and um, operations that we conduct. We also have a media communications group um, at uh, MBI, and of course, Marin Morrison leads that. 
Um, she's always incredibly active promoting, communicating, um, assisting with the social media. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you've probably been living under a rock because we have a new media star in our midst. Um, Winnie Orchard, who's been on the airwaves now for the last week or so, absolute blitz the media. And thank you to Merrin and her team for helping Winnie and, and Shana have their research into um, baby brain um, and some other aspects of um, motherhood being uh, promoted through the media. So I want to move on and talk a little bit about the clinical imaging team, uh, which is with uh, Richard McIntyre um, and Alex, um, who have done a great job on the MR and the PET scan. And of course, they're assisted by others from Monash Health who come across from the medical imaging department um, and undertake the, the uh, scanning on the MR and, and the MR PET scanners for the human studies. Of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of that work without Richard and Alex. Um, so we really appreciate um, their fantastic work on those scanners. Um, I do want to note that Alex has recently been promoted within Monash Health, um, so she won't be coming over so much, but we wish her very well and we look forward to keeping in touch and, and with Lauren and others now joining in more, more uh, frequently with the PET scanning, uh, that would be great. So just a couple of highlights. Um, for those who don't know, we have been working towards doing lung imaging um, with MRI for quite some years. Most of the effort focused on the development of a hyperpolarizer to make uh, polarized xenon gas for imaging here. And we've done a couple of studies in humans, which I'll show a little bit later. Um, but uh, a year or two back, we actually had another approach that was put to us from uh, Kim Prisk over at the University of California, San Diego, um, who's worked with Bruce Thompson now at the Swinburne University and his PhD student, Clara Sullivan, who's come across from Newcastle in the UK. Um, and they've started using another, essentially a T2 star contrast technique to look at changes in oxygenation in the lung. And after some time, Claire's now started doing this ventilation imaging technique. Um, and you can see here a couple of the first images where you could develop a contrast measured with MR um, based on changes of oxygenation in the lungs. So that's, that's a great step forward. Um, we're very really pleased to have that collaboration with Kim and his team. Um, and I look forward to getting now some really large groups of, um, of uh, human subjects through with lung imaging protocols, particularly this one and, and also um, a little bit with the hyperpolarized work. Um, Richard has also given me a list of other MR studies here which have been undertaken, um, some of them um, with people who um, are actively involved at NBI, such as Ian, um, others with the Capri study, which was a study referred to us from the Monash Heart people with the new director there, Steve Nichols, referring across a clinical trial of a new um, uh, uh, pacemaker, uh, MR-compatible pacemaker for testing. Um, and then also a great study with uh, Valentina from the Australian Catholic University um, looking at mindfulness um, with cannabis users. So some really great studies. Um, there are some really great projects in 2021. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Frank Thien from the uh, Eastern Clinical School will be continuing on with his work using hyperpolarized gases to look in the lungs in uh, a number of clinical cohorts. So we look forward to that really getting underway in earnest. Um, Ian's got a number of studies. This one is MR, particularly in Friedrich's ataxia, looking at the development of biomarkers um, for the measurement and assessment of progression in, FDA, in Friedrich's ataxia and also the efficacy of uh, new treatments, uh, clinical trials. So that's ongoing great work. Um, in the MR PET side of things, we had a terrific project late in the year from Paul Hodges and his colleagues at the University of Queensland which Michael Farrell uh, is collaborating on. Um, and this was to look with using FEMPA as a measure of uh, inflammation in the brain in individuals um, with um, uh, ongoing pain, particularly neuropathic lower back pain. Um, so we got some beautiful first images. I think Paul and his colleagues were really um, pleased with the quality of the images. And it's worth noting actually that they have an MR PET scanner in Brisbane, um, so that would have been another possibility, but they chose to come and use the facility here uh, in collaboration with Michael. So I think that's a real testimony to the quality of the research 
uh, facility and expertise. Um, there is a great number of projects on the MR PET scan uh, scheduled for next year, which I'm really pleased about. Shana will be continuing her work, particularly looking at some of the relationships between metabolic and hemodynamic uh, brain networks in, in ageing, in uh, healthy ageing. So that will be um, very exciting. Um, there's a number of now studies set up to use uh, copper 64 labelled ATSM as a biomarker to look at um, oxidative stress in neurodegenerative disease cohorts, which Phyllis Chua, um, together with Andrew Gleason um, and uh, Anjan are working on. Um, and Ian, Ian Harding's also working on a, a copper ATSM study in, um, in Friedrich's ataxia. So I think that will be really exciting. Um, we have a study with Trevor Chong from the School of Psychology and the Turner Institute to look at dopamine synthesis in the striatum associated with decision making. It's a study we've been aiming to do for a number of years. We thought we were going to get it done this year, but COVID actually jumped up. So hopefully next year uh, with Trevor, we'll be able to get that study underway and, and complete that during 2021. Um, when I'm talking about the clinical team at MBI, I think it's incredibly um, pertinent to point out that the clinical imaging team very much depends on the MBI technical support team. All of the instrumentation um, and the, if you like, specialized ways that we undertake and do MR and MR PET brain imaging and body imaging is very much due to the expertise and, and, and terrific work of uh, Parissa and Christina, um, who work really um, with oversight from Michael, um, uh, but have done really so much great work this year. Uh, there is a list here, as you can see, of the achievements of Parissa and Christina throughout this year. Uh, but those researchers who come and use the facilities know that whenever there's any problem, um, it's nothing is too hard or, or too much trouble for Parissa and, and Katerina. Christina to, um, to be able to fix. And as you can see there as well, they've also um, undertaken a massive response to the COVID challenge throughout 2020. Um, whilst I'm mentioning Michael, um, he does of course his own research and he's uh, lent me this very interesting slide. Uh, he's um, been researching into cough and brain mechanisms associated with cough and uh, irritation and uh, nervous cough and uh, of course some disease uh, induced um, causes of cough as well. Um, and he's now mapped out in a beautiful paper published this year in the Journal of Physiology, some of the real um, detailed brainstem mechanisms and nuclei associated with these mechanisms um, during um, the obtrusive challenges in, in uh, individuals with, uh, with airways irritation. Now, Michael um, has been at MBI for nearly 10 years, perhaps nine years, I think, at Monash University uh, with a joint appointment with the Department of Medical Imaging and Radiation Sciences. Um, for some reason, he's um, decided to retire, um, which is ahead of him next year. Um, I'm very sorry that Michael will be leaving us early in the new year um, in retirement, lucky guy. Um, but whilst he says he's retiring, he actually keeps on telling me about experiments he's planning as well. So I'm not sure what retirement means. He might be one of these super scientists, or apart from being a great scientist, he might do a superannuation based retirement arrangement. Let's, let's hope anyway. So I think he was telling me he was going to be doing some of this, but um, we'll see. Um, hopefully he'll be back and doing lots of experimental work with us next year as well. Um, I'd like to just touch on the MR image analysis team um, and give you an update on their achievements during 2020. So the team's led by Xiaolin Chen, and you can see here the team members with quite a number of PhD students. Um, some are jointly supervised with the Indian Institute of Technology in, in Bombay, in Mumbai, um, such as Viswanath, who recently submitted his PhD. Um, others with colleagues, collaborators in the Faculty of Engineering. Um, Himashi Paris, who's joined in early this year, um, and some new um, candidates as well who will be joining, just recently joined, Cameron Payne, um, and others from engineering. So this team's really growing. We were sorry this year to lose um, both Shengpin and Tom, 
um, recruited to CSIRO in the case of Schenkman and Tom has gone to Sydney University, uh, but we've been very uh, pleased that we could find Shenzhen to step up and take on the um, NIF informatics um, fellow role with us at MBI. So the team has been amazingly productive this year. Um, over 18 reviewed journal and conference publications, uh, two patents in the national phase and one new patent, um, a new grant which Zhao Lin was awarded from the Australia Search Council Discovery Project Scheme a month or so back, um, and a couple of other projects that were funded through from industry. Um, there's been a lot of honours and awards for the team as well, um, as you can see here in the slide, um, really achieving, uh, I think, a real international recognition for the team in their research work across um, MR, across joint modality approaches with MR PET, um, and also now with uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence techniques um, with both MR and MR PET data sets. So it's a very uh, active and a very um, high impact area of research. Um, there's, there's really great collaborations already established um, and, and some new ones developing. I think the one that I'd like to note here is really in particular with um, the research team in Germany in Ulic um, at the Helmholtz Research Facility in Ulic led by John Shah. Um, John was involved with us in more detail a few years back, but we've just recently published 10, uh, our 10th joint publication with that group. So I think that's a great tribute to the uh, high quality of the work that comes out of the MR image analysis team. And what do they do? Here's some examples. Um, I think it's really lovely to see these images. Um, example one is a work from Biswanath PhD, uh, where he uses the MR to improve the quality of the PET reconstruction. That's a lovely result. Uh, the second one is uh, with Camlish's work with motion correction deep learning network. And you see here an improvement using this network, this model, an AI model to remove motion, the degradation of images due to motion. Um, the third example was from Schenken's work in his postdoc, which was really around um, methods for establishing um, uh, functional PET or time varying PET signals and relating those with uh, the time varying hemodynamic responses with functional MRI. Those beautiful work published this year in NeuroImage. Um, an example four shows you the work from Anjan in his PhD project um, looking at essentially QSM or iron sensitive imaging techniques, in this case in the motor neuron disease uh, patients that were studied longitudinally. And that was published as well this year. And just to give you a sense of you know, what these images, how these images can be improved, this is the work that this one art did with a regular PET image reconstruction on the left. And this is a very low dose PET image. So that's why it appears very noisy. If you obviously give a lot of radioactivity, you can get a very high quality image. Um, but in the case where you want to reduce dose and reduce radiation exposure, um, you would end up with this sort of PET image as shown on the left. But when you collect them with a simultaneous MR PET scanner, you can use the MR anatomy to help guide the, if you like, distribution of the radioactivity measured in the PET image. And so on the right side, you see this uh, joint reconstruction, um, which is, I think personally, it's a different looking image, but when you look at it in more detail, the anatomy and the gray matter in the anatomy, both cortical and subcortical nuclei, is where the predominant signal comes from the FDG PET signal. So this is where it's being mapped to in this nice um, joint in our PET reconstruction. And when you look at the motion correction approach from uh, Camlish's work, um, on the left column, you can see the two images from a degraded uh, image. And this is actually a patient study that, which was done up at the Alfred Hospital. So the real utility of this approach is in situations where either very fast scans have to be applied and people move or there's relatively little information. Or alternatively, if people are moving constantly um, and you're unable to get them to stay still, such as in the emergency department, the potential of this approach is to actually use images with artifacts from motion, but um, remove those through the deep learning network and come up with these images you can see on the right, which obviously are, are greatly improved. So that's terrific work coming out of the uh, MR image analysis team. 
I want to turn to the preclinical imaging team. Um, it's um, both here and at the Alfred site. Um, Mike Devere and his team with Gang and Tara and Katie have done terrific work this year, a lot of achievements, um, a lot of utilisation of the instruments in spite of COVID, so that's been really great. In fact, they are the only team that was here really, you know, every day, every week, right through the year, and, and all the team members were here. So I really take my hat off to them and, and thank them for that work throughout the year. Um, they've done some terrific work. You see here work which Katie and Gang have done jointly. On the left is the ultrasound imaging. And on the right is the MR imaging, a short axis view of a mouse heart. And if you think about how quickly the mouse heart beats, I think it's 500 beats per minute. I thought it was 300, but Katie told me it's five or 600 when they're not anaesthetized. So incredibly fast uh, rate of uh, beating. And yet these beautiful ultrasound and MR images show exquisite detail in a mouse heart. So this is this beautiful work done with uh, Christian Samuel from Pharmacology. Um, and this is work that's gonna be also used, or this, this technique will also be used with colleagues now, uh, with Christine Bubb and others um, working with the, the new Victorian Heart Institute. Um, another great study that the preclinical team here have done uh, is shown in this slide. Um, I'm not really very up to speed on this other than uh, Mike told me that Tara has been working with Mikhail Martini Martino at the uh, Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute and uh, it's looking at the ability to uh, do, do skull healing with some new hydrogel therapies um, but obviously a strong resemblance to a well-known phantom. Um, moving on to the Arambi site uh, which opened uh, uh, nearly two years ago, I think. And uh, Rob uh, is the facility manager there and an imaging support scientist. Uh, Bianca Jupp is the PET CT uh, scientist in the facility. Um, they've been very busy all year. We just had our ops committee meeting this morning. Um, it's basically running 24 seven. So that's really fantastic. Um, there's been some terrific results from that work um, this year. And uh, you can see here some lovely images looking in the PET scanner with PET tau protein imaging um, and then pre and post a middle cerebral artery occlusion model in a rat. So you can see that that tau signal is greatly increased. And on the right, there's some very nice images there that you can see using the micro CT capacity. Um, David Wright is the associate professor and head of the department of preclinical imaging research at the um, Alfred site in the Central Clinical School. Um, and David's team have been um, in, the, in the vanguard of the establishment of these very beautiful high resolution diffusion and, uh, and tractography images back on the front cover of our annual report from last year. Um, David's shared me with these slides of his uh, lab's output um, with um, a range of techniques they're using, particularly in, I think, neurotrauma, but also now in increasingly neurodegenerative models as well. And they've had a great, uh, su uh, successful year um, with the preclinical work. Uh, and as I wanted to note that David was just a week or so back awarded the Victorian Biomedical Imaging Capability Emerging Leader Award. Uh, which was the inaugural award. So congratulations to David. I think that's a terrific um, recognition of his, um, his terrific work and his emerging leadership in the field. Um, I now want to move on to some of the research teams, uh, the Link Labs that are based um, at MBI. Um, and just quickly give you an update. So this is the Cognitive Neuroimaging Lab led by Shana, um, who together with Phil until he left us late last year um, have really built up particularly the cognitive imaging um, with simultaneous MR PET methods. Um, as you can see here, um, Shana's team has grown very substantially and uh, in particular Katarina Boyd, who many of you may know when she worked here tech support until four or five years ago, Katarina is going to be rejoining in the new year as a postdoc working in Shana's group. So that's, that's really terrific. Um, they've been very, uh, very, very productive um, as well. And you can see here the list of recently and accepted and submitted papers. Um, 
their work in particular in phantom kicks in mums to be, as well as in the long-term age, aging effects of um, parenthood have really caught the media attention um, and of course uh, is highly novel and very innovative work. So um, it's great to see that work now coming into the literature. Uh, so, um, and their outputs as well as scientific in terms of publications and media in terms of um, the Winnie's media stardom. I did want to note that they've also published a couple of open access data sets throughout 2020. Um, and that's really had an impact. Um, these are data sets collected on the in our PET scanner, which are being shared through Open Euro based over at Stanford. Um, and there's quite a lot of data shared there, mostly MR, some very small number of just PET cohort or PET, PET data sets. But a simultaneous MR PET data set has not been shared until this year. Um, and in fact, that's now become one of the most downloaded PET data sets on the, on the site with over um, 130 downloads and eight, over 8,000 views. And then just in the last few weeks, there's been um, a second data set, which was a visual task, simultaneous functional MR and functional PET data set shared. And that's already had over 4,000 views. So I think this is a really significant um, step forward. And I do encourage researchers to, to look at ways of openly sharing their data sets. We're working through the IRIS and the work that Shenzhen is doing with Jalen's team to have automated mechanisms for being able to export all the relevant information in the right format into these open sharing data sets. So we're really going to push hard on that in, in 2021. Um, the team's got um, a good set of plans um, and I won't go through this, but I did actually like the slide here with Winnie's um, plan is to leave home. So good on you Winnie, that's a great aspiration to have. I'm sure you need a, a, a much bigger place now with all the media coming knocking at your door. Um, I want to move on and talk about Ian Harding's lab. Ian um, was in the Turner Institute until last year and he moved across uh, at the beginning of this year to the um, Central Clinical School. Um, Ian's um, obviously actively involved in the research um, imaging studies here at MBI and increasingly at, um, at the Arambi node. Um, the work that Ian and his team are doing is, is really outstanding and uh, he's loved some lovely studies which have been published this year, um, including one by Louisa, um, which is in submission looking at the longitudinal change in the frigiosotaxia cohort um, over two years. This study has been going on for some time, done here at NBI on the, on the SCARA scanner, um, with beautiful measurements showing, well firstly, a really comprehensive method to comprehensively assess the structural longitudinal changes, um, and then to map those very exquisitely, uh, both in the cerebrum as well as the cerebellum. The beautiful work that's come out of that uh, experiment um, and some of you may know, Ian did one of the first MR PET studies um, with the uh, FAMPA tracer back um, some time ago. Um, and uh, that was again in a Friedrichs cohort as well as a Huntington's cohort. And you can see here some of the recent um, uh, axial views of this cohort of Friedrichs patients with the distribution of um, the FAMPA compound down in the cerebellum in to different degrees in this, in this cohort. So I think this is currently in preparation for publication and we look forward to seeing that come out. Um, and what's in the pipeline from that group? Well, here's some beautiful work, I think, which will come out hopefully in 2021. As I mentioned earlier, looking at um, uh, oxidative stress markers in neurodegenerative diseases with the copper ATSM compound. That's a complicated study. We get the copper across from Samri in Adelaide, has to fly in the night before gets labelled here by Brett Patterson and his team in the Radio Chem Lab. And then it gets injected into patients and then we try and do a few patients in a day because it's an expensive process. I think the degree of difficulty on this one is, is way up there, um, but we're, we're, we're looking forward in the new year to getting this study really fully underway. And then on the right, you see there's some work um, Ian's been leading an Enigma, um, a, an Enigma working group um, in um, ataxias and has uh, submitted a great paper across to uh, Lancet 
um, recent Lancet neurology on this uh, meta uh, multi-center clinical trial uh, and a, um, a, a meta analysis or a meta analytic approach to look at the changes across small groups of, um, in this case, a three groups cohort. And there's future work coming out, I think, now looking in segmentation and variance within the cerebellum in, this, in, this, in these groups. I wanted to mention Adil Razi's team, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the computational neuroscience team, but um, also is much broader than that uh, because Adil and his team members, including Leonardo Novelli, who's joined in as a, a postdoc fellow with uh, Adil, uh, and his PhD students, he's very actively working on a number of um, very exciting and novel studies. I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of, um, their um, tool of choice, you might say, is using um, modeling of, uh, of functional data sets, particularly functional MRI, particularly resting state, using dynamic cortical causal modeling approaches uh, to model that data. And there's been some beautiful work published very, very nicely this year. Um, but I think the really interesting study that will be happening next year uh, with Devin Stolker, who's one of the US PhD students, will be to look at essentially altered states of consciousness in normal subjects um, using psilocybin um, as a psychedelic in these individuals. This is a study that will be conducted at NBR, will be the first study of that type in Australia, possibly I think one of three or four in the world. Um, and we'll really go to the heart of using um, advanced imaging um, and very sophisticated modeling to understand changes in causality within the brain and, and networks of causally related areas in the brain in response to altered states of consciousness. So I really look forward to that work um, getting underway in the new year and seeing the results of that. Um, so then just to come towards the end of my presentation today, what's in the pipeline um, from MBI a little bit more broadly. Uh, some of you will know that I have been working on a Monash cyclotron facility for a few years. Um, we're very close to having that confirmed. I uh, thought it might have been able to be something I could announce today, but not quite. We have approval from the National Imaging Facility, but we still need some supporting funding for that, so we're matching funding. Um, nevertheless, we've pushed on with the concept to say, not just a research facility based here at um, MBI, but in fact, to expand that with industry partners and build a radio pharmaceutical manufacturing innovation center. Um, and so we've just been finalizing a grant submission to the NRFF um, to look at a business planning process to undertake this. And as you can see from the slide here, um, the, the, it really is encapsulated in, in the catalyst, which would build out the Australian Precision Radio Pharmaceuticals Facility or the core cyclotron based R&D facility uh, with industry partners to really deliver on the needs that we have nationally. And those needs are very much around um, novel new theranostics, uh, diagnostics, combined diagnostic and therapeutic approaches with uh, radio pharmaceuticals, um, very much in cancer at the moment. And then we believe in cardiovascular disease and neurological diseases as these techniques get further developed. So this is, um, I think are really exciting and um, I think an important development. Um, it's, 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 it's something which again, I had put to me by Professor Ian Smith when I first joined Monash to say that Monash um, is the sort of organization that will need to have its own cyclotron facility within the decade. Uh, so still a decade, hopefully by the end of the month that will come to fruition. Um, we have um, a whole range of partners supporting this proposal. So I think we're very, very, got a very strong proposal. Um, I do want to also mention in relation to that, that strengthening our molecular imaging and radiochemistry research capabilities uh, is being now done jointly in collaboration with the Helmholtz Dresden uh, Research Center. So that's part of the Helmholtz Association in Germany. Um, and we were very um, pleased a few months back to be awarded from the Helmholtz Association in Germany, um, a joint international lab between Monash University and uh, Helmholtz Dresden. And that's very much in recognition of the research done in discovery science through the Department of Chemistry, Phil Andrews and his team, his collaborators, 
um, over the last decade. And from that discovery science with uh, different polymers and different chemistry techniques, it's now being expanded out to look at both preclinical applications, and the biomedical uh, imaging uh, needs for that, as well as then translation into phase one, first in man human clinical trials. So that's a very exciting development. We had great support from the new uh, Vice Provost uh, of the research, uh, Rebecca Brown, who now has responsibility for the research infrastructure as well. Um, and the last thing in the pipeline, for those of you who haven't been to MBI for some time, is the new Victorian Heart Hospital immediately across the road from MBI. I walked out a few hours ago and took a snap. Here's the size of the hospital as it's going up. Quite remarkable. Um, the rate of construction is, is really impressive. Um, and it's all slated to be um, completed. I think now it's beginning of 2023, but approximately the end of, of uh, 2022 as well when the next state election will be held. So that's a very big and important development in our precinct. So thank you for your attention. In conclusion, I just wanted to uh, remind you of what an amazingly special year it's been. Um, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. So let's see if this works. In stage one, we say nothing's going to happen. Stage two, we say something may be going to happen, but we should do nothing about it. In stage three, we say that maybe we should do something about it, but there's nothing we can do. <laughs> I love that one. I also like this one too. I thought this was a great joke about some of the challenges we had in Victoria with our contact tracing some months back. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so I'll just remind everyone, please feel free to um, type any of your questions in for Gary um, about what has been and what will be. But I, I guess I could kick off, Gary. I, I'm interested to know, and it may be that it's you know, far from finalised, but the sphere of influence of, uh, of a cyclotron when, when it does arrive, would, would it be providing services not only for research, but for um, like uh, health services more generally, like um, FDG and so on uh, for um, clinical so purposes? We, we wouldn't be doing sort of routine or currently routinely produced yeah, pharmaceuticals such as FDG, like there are commercial suppliers set up to do that, so they'll continue to do that. Now the focus on the facility here is the research and research requirements for Monash University and its partners, um, which um, you know, include a number of F18 labelled you know, experimental compounds, uh, as well as um, some of the radiometal labelled compounds. Um, which were mentioned, such as copper 64, labelled ATSM. Um, there's also a number of um, uh, radioisotopes, which are currently either imported or available through generators, such as gallium 68, which would be um, produced and then used in essentially support for first in man, but particularly phase two and three uh, clinical trial work, where the where the radio pharmaceuticals have to be produced under GMP, good manufacturing practice conditions. And in fact, that's not happening anywhere in Australia at the moment. So we really identified this is a very major need and something which can't be addressed anywhere in Australia at the moment. So that's, that's a key driver. And then the other point is what's occurred during 2020, due to COVID, um, some of the other more conventional spec radioisotopes could not be imported and they're not able to be made in Australia. Um, so they could not be imported. There was a major sovereign risk associated with their availability. And so um, the cyclotron facility that we have funding for at Monash would be of a large enough size to produce those spec radioisotopes. And, and that's becoming also now a critical part of the proposal. And a related question, um, neuroscience um, centric, um, would, would the proximity of the cyclotron make it feasible to, to do H2O15 studies of regional cerebral blood flow, or is, it, uh, or is that going to be... Uh... Um, it's a bit like using a sledgehammer to crack an acorn, I think, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so, practically speaking, the, the one that's funded would, would, would be dedicated to longer irradiation times for okay. some of the solid targets. Mm. But in the, in the facility, we've envisaged 
that capability with very small, like there's a small bar fridge sized, you know, deuteron, cyclotron, deuteron particle. Okay. Cyclotron that can do that water production. It could be in close proximity to the... Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, we're not exactly being overwhelmed by uh, uh, questions at the moment. So um, obviously you've covered the field very, uh, very comprehensively, Gary, and I, I am conscious of the time. So in the absence of any other further questions, we might uh, conclude the session and just, just thank everyone for their attendance. I, I noted there was quite a substantial number of people. So thank you again, Gary, for a, a particularly informative uh, review of the year that's been and looking forward to the future as well. Thanks, thank you very much.